Amen. All right, I want you to pray for me this morning, or this evening. See, I don't even know what time of day it is. You need to pray for the preacher as he preaches your word, or the word of God. And I want you to turn into 2 Corinthians 5, 17. That's where I want you, that's where we're going to, want you to open your Bibles to. Now, the last... Um, for this year, we've been talking about the word be, be, talk about be thankful, be this, be that. Tonight, we're going to talk about the beginning, all right, the beginning. I threw that in there, just thought it would be a good little topic with a be in there. But the beginning is the point in which something begins or starts. Okay, something that begins or starts. In Genesis 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then John 1, 1 and 2 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And with that, I want us to pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank You for this wonderful evening You've given us. Lord, there's so many things that's going on in our lives right now. Lord, there's trials, there's tribulations, there's good, there's bad, but Lord, I ask that you'll help us concentrate just on your word tonight. Let us concentrate on our life. Are we living the life that you need us to live? Are we living the life that we're supposed to be living as Christians? Lord, I love you and I thank you for this opportunity to preach your word tonight. I thank you for everyone that's here. Lord, I just ask that we can come together and worship in your name under one accord. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> so I want to talk about the word beginning and also the word new. When there's something starts, something that begins, it's also new. Alright, like we, we're beginning a new church plant. Notice how we're beginning a new church plant. It's new. It's something. New is having recently come into existence, recent modern, or being other than the former, former old. But see, we have to understand that, that there's two different points of beginning in our lives. There's a physical beginning, and there's a spiritual beginning. Unlike God, we have a beginning. We have a birth date. There was a time that we, that we were started. We were born. And then, like God, we have no ending. We have eternity. All right? And so each person has a physical birth, and this is a day as a, a person you were born into the world. Now, I believe that life starts at conception, but right now we're going to talk about the physical part of it. But each person does not have a spiritual birth. The spiritual birth is when one comes in accepting Jesus Christ as Savior, and this is when our spirit becomes new. And our new life has a beginning. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's a time where we've accepted Jesus Christ and we started a spiritual birth. And then we are babes in Christ and we start growing. And there's a time where we need to mature in our Christian life. We can't continue to be babes in Christ. Today, we've had, we, we have a lot of Christians that are sitting in your churches today that have been sitting in churches for 20 or 30 years and are still babes in Christ. They're still drinking milk and they're not eating the meat. There's a time in our life where we need to stand up and start living the Christian life we need to. It's a new life. God has given us a new beginning. And I tell you, folks, with everything that goes on in this church, and I'm thinking of the RU program, I'm thinking of just the discipleship programs, the Bible Institute, everything that's going on. How many times has God given us something new? A new way we can change our lives. Even as Christians, you know, it, we see people fall and stumble and backslide. But God still gives them a brand new day. You know what, with everything, I, I've been so stressed out today, it's been unbelievable. 
been unbelievable. I know my blood pressure has been rising and just everything that's going on. And you know what? I was thinking as I, I was going through this message, tomorrow's a new day. That sun goes down and the sun comes right back up and tomorrow is supposed to be sunny, it's supposed to be nice. You know, the, the Buckeyes are going to wear new uniforms this Saturday. <laughs> you know, all gray. You know, I'm, I'm a, I, there, there's times in our lives where things are new. And there's a beginning, but when we accepted Jesus Christ our Savior, that was a new beginning. We don't need to have to have the old. 2 Corinthians 5.17, if you turn there with me. Are you opened up there? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? A new creature. And then what's the next word? Old things are what? Passed away. We don't need to go back to those old things, folks. We don't need to live the old life we've been living. Christ has given us a new life. A new chapter. Behold, all things are become new. Verse 18, And all things are of God who hath re reconciled us to him or himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. If you look throughout the New Testament, Jesus Christ, Peter, Paul, all of them, John, talk about the word new. How it's new. The first miracle that Jesus Christ did was what? The wine. What did the man say when he tasted that wine? Yes, this is new wine. Usually you give us the, you know, the, the new wines first and then you give us out the old. This way, you give them the old and give them the new. Christ was showing that, hey, this is new, it's pure. It's without blemish. It's without spot. It's without leaven. It's not fermented. One of the things I've been trying to teach over in Armenia is that, you know, these, there's still a lot of churches that do wine. Yes. And the wine that is wine today and not wine that was wine back then. And I asked, I said, why do you still do it? Well, everybody does it throughout here. Everybody in, you know, in, in Russia and, and up in here and everything because they used to be part of the Soviet Union. I said, well, if everybody jumped off a bridge, would you? And the pastor just kind of looked at me. I said, listen, it doesn't even make sense. I said, because you take the bread and it's unleavened bread. It's new, it's pure. But you're going to give them leavened drink? And I was trying to teach them how, you know, what, what I was talking about. I didn't even talk about wine in the communion. It says fruit of the vine. My guy was talking in class last night. I believe Christ was taking those grapes and He was making that grape juice right there. Showing the breaking of His body. And showing how His blood's going to be. Our new life has a new beginning in Christ. And we should not want to go back to the old ways that we were once. Listen, none of us in here has lived a perfect life. None of us in here are perfect. I mean, you can talk to my wife and, and, and she'll agree with that. I'm not a perfect person. Our spiritual side, and let me tell you something, our spiritual side would be fighting and cause our physical side to become ill. When you're not living the life that you need to be living spiritually, your physical side is going to become ill. It can't, it, it can't do it. Now, you know, are we going to get sick even if we're living a great spiritual life? Can we still get cancer? Can we still get those things? Of course you can. But when you're not living the life that God has given you, our physical side isn't going to be able to keep up with that spiritual side. It's going to start failing. It's going to start, certain things are going to start happening. I know when... There was a time in my life I, I ran. I didn't backslide. I ran. And I got away, and, and I thank God that I, I, got, I got right with God. And I saw what was going on. I thank God for my wife, because she helped me get back on that right path. But let me tell you something. I, I lived the most miserable life I could possibly live. I was never happy. I was always convicted. And I was always sick. 
I was always sick. The new cannot be mixed with the old. And it talks about that throughout Scripture, doesn't it? It says you can't put new wine in old bottles. Why? Because they'd burst. You can't put new uh, fabric with old fabric because they'd rent. They would tear. I, I know that my, my wife, uh, my great-grandmother, I have a blankie. And, and, and I've had this blanket ever since I was a child. All right, and, my, and, and why I love this blanket, it's, not, it's, it's packed up, it's put away in storage now just because it got so old and just started to, just to, start to rent and just fall apart. I mean, you look at it and it, you could just see the fabric just fall. And my wife tried so hard to keep that blanket for me as long as she could. And she, would take, she took new fabric and sewn it into the old and you know what happened? It just ripped apart. And if you ladies know anything about sewing and knowing, you know that stuff's true, don't you? Ladies, can I get an amen? amen? Yeah, see, they didn't know that. If there's some guys out there that do it too. You know, and I, I've done it. You know, I'm not the brightest candle in the candle factory, folks. And I've tried it. I try to put Band-Aid on, on, on things, you know, and it just won't last. You know what? Sometimes you just got to go all new to make something last longer. I was thinking about this too as living a new life in Christ. We don't need to be going back to the old ways we were. We can't keep on riding the fence. I talked about that Sunday, having one foot in hell and one foot in heaven. You can't, you can't do it. It can't be done. We're going to have to make a choice sometime in our life of which way we're going to be. But I was thinking about Lot in Genesis. In chapter 19, verses 24 through 29, we don't, you don't have to turn there. I just want to kind of share something with you. But you remember about Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot and the life he was living there. They go in and they're trying to get him out. Lot was saved from Sodom, but took Sodom with him. You ever notice that? He, the life he was living there, he, he just took it. He, 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 it didn't change his life getting out of the city. We can try to run from sin all we want. You can try to move to a different country, a different city, move into a different house, get a different job. But if you don't get right with God, that sin's going to follow you. He was saved so as by fire, but his life work was burned up. Even his wife might have been saved, but her heart was wedded to the city. Remember, she turned around and turned to that pillar of salt. Our life can get so involved inside of the world that we miss where we should be going. Folks, we cannot keep on doing what we're doing and expect God to do something great in our lives. Expect prayers to be answered. Expect certain things in our lives to happen the way we think they should and we're questioning God, but we're not living the life that we should. So you cannot plan to live a good Christian changed life and still go back to old friends and old ways. Riding the fence will get you nowhere. So there must be a new beginning and a new life. Matthew 6, 24. Turn there for me. I know this is very familiar. I have to say this verse to me all the time. Matthew 6, verse 24. It says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. I think we need to take that verse to heart. I tell you what, there's a lot in here today. There's a lot that come in here on Friday nights. There's a lot that we see on Thursday nights in the prisons. And I see them overseas. That we as Christians, we try to hold on to the life we had because we're afraid that we're going to lose something great. Our families come after us. Our friends come after us. Make fun of us so we just join in the crowd so we, don't, so we don't think we look like idiots. 
But let me tell you something. When you start standing up for what's right and you start taking a place as a good soldier of Christ, they'll respect you. When you start taking accountability and responsibility for your life and the life you should be living, they will respect you. I've said this many times before at the firehouse. Even as a fire chief, my guys would come in and make fun of me because I was sitting there reading having my devotion time early in the morning. Have my door cracked. And they'd come in, they'd see it, and they'd say, oh, sorry, we'll let you be. But as a group, they would come in and kind of joke around with me. And I'd just sit there and look at them. i said, boys, what do you want? Or are you going to keep on reading that Bible? Are you going to do this? Are you, uh, you feel better? And I said, there's the door if you don't like it. What do you need? You know, and this and that. But you know what? When one of them had a problem, they'd come in and say, Chief, can we talk to you privately? Can I have some time? Sure. Come on in. Sit down. And I make sure I had everything off, I'd have everything, and I just concentrate on them. They said, "Man, I'm having some time with my wife, or I'm having problems with money, I'm having problems with this or that." You know why they're coming to me? Because they knew where I stood. My guys knew I prayed for them. In fact, the atheist who I was partnered up on the medic with most of the time, he said, "Don't make me, don't make no fun of Ron. He's the only one that prays for us. He loves us, and he didn't believe in God at all." But he would stand beside me, you know why? Because that's where I stood. There has to be a time in your life where you decide to become a Christian soldier. Woman or man. There's a time where we've got to get our hearts right and start living straight. Brother Flesher, I'm sure you have seen quite a bit in your time of people falling, falling away. I bet you have some stories you could tell, too. I'm not going to ask you to do those. But I'm sure you've got a book you could probably write on that, don't you? No man can serve two masters. But folks, we're, we, tonight I want it to be a new night for you. You know what? Because in God's days, it, what, it started in the evening and went to the day. So right now, let's start this evening as a new day. Right here. Right now. Matthew 5. Just go over a chapter there in your book. Verses 14 and 16. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. Every time I read that I want to say under a bushel, no. I'm going to let it shine. Don't you? Well, every time I read that verse, it gets to me. But put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Verse 16, let your life so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let me ask you this, are you letting your light shine? Are they able to see Jesus Christ in you? Or are you mocking our Lord and Savior. Let me tell you what, if you're not living a Christian life, please quit telling people you're Christian. Please quit downgrading my Lord and Savior and what He did on that cross. But there's a time where we have to do it. I'm going to give you some homework. Read uh, 1 John chapter 1. Talk about walking in the light versus the darkness. Ephesians 6, verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Notice there, we wrestle not against flesh, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness. We are in a battle. I want to start winning this battle. I know who gets a victory at the end. I read the book. But it doesn't mean that we just get to sit here and, and get beat up on. In the Bible, it talks about we are the ones that are supposed to be pulling down strongholds. We are on the offense. We're not supposed to be on the defense all the time. We need to be the ones going out and getting them. And when Satan starts coming after us, yes, are we going to have to defend and fight? Yes. But that means that we need to start pulling down some strongholds. Whatever's holding you back, tear it down. There needs to be a new beginning. Matthew 13, verse 22. Go there. 
Matthew 13. Talk about sowing the seeds. But notice this one here. I'm trying to find it there. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that re- heareth the word in the care of this world. And the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. You know what that's talking about? You're weak. You hear it, but then the world takes over. Most of us work anywhere between 20 to 80 hours a week, depending on where you work. And we come to church, what, four or five hours a week? Who do you think is going to win? But we can change all that if we just begin right now and start it all over new and get right. I want you to think about investing something. I'm not talking about your money and your billfold so you're safe. I know being a missionary, you guys are like, man, he's a, like a used car salesman. man, all, all he wants is money. No. And I don't want your money. But I want you to invest your life. I want your life to change. I want you to invest your life in the kingdom of God and not for the things of this world. You understand what I'm saying? I want you to invest your life in eternity. Remember Brother Jarvis had, had my son string that pretty banner across there and he talked about just this little part over there just being the life we're living in right now. And then all of the rest of it goes for eternity. Do you understand that eternity doesn't end? It doesn't end when we get put in that ground. It just begins. But I like for our eternity to begin right now. The, the day you got saved is when your eternity began. I want you to act like it. I want myself to act like it. But we can only do this if we pray for each other. If we help each other. Satan's hitting this church hard. Satan's your number one churchgoer, ain't he? He knows that Bible inside. He knows that Bible better than you do. So he can twist the words. But you should know that Bible just as well as he does. You should know that Bible just as well as Jesus Christ did because when Satan got, got him in the wilderness, he twisted all those words. Twist that, but God fought him with the Word of God. When you start having those trials and you start getting hit, you start getting cravings. You start wanting to go back to your old ways. How do you fight that? Do you even fight that? Or you just go and just do it? Because Satan knows what buttons to push. Sometimes he knows what buttons to push on you better than you know. Because every time he pushes it, you just walk around like a robot. And you just do it. That's the worst robot impersonation I ever did. But... <laughs> That's what happens in our lives. We need to start studying the Word of God. We need to start making it into our life. Make it become real if you have to. But I was teaching in class last night. I gave them some maps in in the New Testament survey, Brother Xavier's class. And I gave them a map of Asia Minor, where the cities were in Bible time, and then I gave them a present time, Turkey, you know, where those cities are now and what they're called. And I'm trying to get them to see. I want you to see that this Bible's real. Those cities are still there. Nineveh, the walls are still there. Jerusalem is still there. Egypt is still there. And I've said this so many times before, and we've missed it. We missed it in the news. And that's where every Christian should have got up and shouted. And when ISIS went into Mosul, Iraq, and tried and try to take over that city, he tore down... The memorial to Jonah is what they did. You know what that tells me? That story was real. Jonah was swallowed by that whale. Everybody goes, this is a big fish. Well, Jesus Christ said it was a whale. But you know what? He walked all the way from shore, walked clear across that desert up to Iraq, took him forever, get up there smelling like fish vomit. And he had a bad attitude all the way. 
It was real. The Bible's real. And what he says is going to happen is going to be real. And there's going to be a day where we have to stand up before him face to face and take accountability for our lives. I cannot have my mom, my grandparents, my children, my wife go up there and stand for me. It's going to be me and me alone. It's going to be me and the Almighty Creator, my Lord and Savior, my God, standing there who loves me so much He died for me. And i got to tell Him how weak I was. There's a beginning. And in the beginning is the day that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Let's make it new tonight. Let's get rid of that oldness and bring it up new. Can we do that tonight? All right, let's stand. Brother Reed, you come on up here. We're going to pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank You so much, Lord, for what You've done for us. How You made our lives and gave us a new beginning, not just from our physical birth, but from our spiritual birth. That all things, all things were passed away. All the old stuff, Lord, all of our sinful nature, it's gone. Lord, I just ask that You help us search our hearts, Lord, and, and that we get it out of our head that certain things that we need or certain things we want to do, but start searching our hearts for what You want. It's Your will that I want done now. Just because I surrender doesn't mean that I, I lose everything I want, but Lord, now it's Your will becomes my will. And I, Lord, I just want to do right. I want to live a life that's pleasing to You, that glorifies Your name and magnifies Your name. Lord, I ask that tonight You'll work in all of our hearts. Change who we are, Lord, so we can live a more fruitful life, a righteous life for Your kingdom. Lord, and one day we know You're coming and we look so forward to that. Just singing and worshiping You for eternity.